Hi, this is Dr. Gregory Sadler. I'm a professor of philosophy and the president and founder of an educational consulting company called Reason.io, where we put philosophy into practice. I've studied and taught philosophy for over 20 years, and I find that many people run into difficulties reading classic philosophical texts. Sometimes it's the way things are said or how the text is structured, but the concepts themselves are not always that complicated, and that's where I come in. To help students and lifelong learners, I've been producing longer lecture videos and posting them to YouTube. Many viewers say they find them useful. What you're currently watching is part of a new series of shorter videos, each of them focused on one core concept from an important philosophical text. I hope you find it useful as well. In Book 10 of his Confession, St. Augustine discusses at significant length the power of memory. And one of the things that he focuses on in one particular chapter is the emotions, or as we can call them following his own verbiage, the affections of the human mind. And there's some paradoxical things that he notes when it comes to these. You know, a lot of times when we dredge something out of memory, we're bringing that thing before our, you know, mental eyes or in our mind and we're, you know, having it there to scrutinize. When it comes to our emotions, it doesn't seem that that's actually the case. So what are some examples of this? Well, he says that without emotion, I remember having felt that particular emotion. And he gives a number of different examples of this. He says that the memory contains the affections of my mind, not in that manner in which the mind has them at the time it experiences them, like being angry at the time or sad, but in a very different manner after the fashion in which the power of memory retains memory itself. Without actually being joyful, I remember myself to have been joyful. So I can think about being joyful all I want. That's not necessarily going to make me joyful. Or without actually being sad, I recall my past sorrow. Without fear, I recall that I was at one time fearful. Without desire, I'm mindful of previous desires. So this is kind of strange, isn't it? That we can bring our past emotions, our experiences of these to light, and yet we don't actually feel them. Well, it gets even better. Sometimes we can feel the opposites or at least a different sort of thing. I can feel a different emotion remembering an emotion. He chooses opposites. So he says that I remember with joy my bygone sorrow. Well, why would we remember with joy our sorrow from the past? Well, we think, well, I should have been sad back then and I'm not feeling that now. So that that's good. Right. And he says with sorrow, I remember past joy. Why would remembering past joy make us sad? Well, we might think, well, I shouldn't have taken joy in stealing those fruit or pick whatever other example we want from Augustine's life or our own lives. And we can think of all sorts of emotions. We could think of feeling fearful of our past emotions. We could think of being angry that we felt something at the time, perhaps angry at others for making us feel that, perhaps angry at ourselves. We could feel all sorts of things, hope, despair. Um, we could feel you know, an expression of surprise or amazement that we felt something, you know, looking back at it. There's all sorts of possible modalities. What we're not feeling is the emotion that is under discussion, the one that is coming up. And Augustine gives us an analogy to try to explain it. He says that, well, maybe memory is sort of like the mind's stomach. You know, the stomach is where we store the food. Now, of course, we know physiologically there's more things going on. It's breaking it down and all of that. But just go with, with the analogy for the time being. We eat the food. We taste the food, right? And it goes down our throat. We have that feeling of fullness. And now the stomach is, is full. If you want to say not necessarily stomach, but the whole digestive tract, go ahead. You're not tasting it while it's in your belly. 
right? You're done tasting it. As a matter of fact, that's why some people are like, well, I need to eat some more. You know, there's that old commercial about, uh, I, think, I think it was Lay's potato chips. You can't eat just one. Why not? Because you ate the one and, oh, that was so good. And now it's down in my stomach. I'd like to have that experience again. Let me have another potato chip. And then you find the whole bag is gone after a while and your stomach is, oh, I shouldn't eat so many potato chips. It doesn't feel good. But it's not the taste of it that's bothering you. It's the sensation of fullness. There's different things going on with the stomach. And so Augustine says, you know, maybe joy and sadness are like sweet and bitter food. Now, why does he choose sweet and bitter food? Well, because in the ancient uh, way of looking at flavors, interestingly enough, sweet is on one end and bitter is on the other end of a spectrum. You'll find Aristotle talking about this, for example, in uh, On Sense and the Sensible and On the Soul. And this is a very common way of looking at flavors. You know, the, the bitter stuff, well, that's kind of like sadness. Sweet is kind of like joy. We might associate other emotions. Maybe fear is like the salty or anger is like the, the uh, sour, you know, we could go on and on and on. By the way, in ancient times, it was common to distinguish anywhere between seven to nine flavors uh, basic flavors of food. And so this is, this is something that his audience would be quite familiar with. And so, you know, when you're chewing the food, you, when you're having the experience of the joy or the sadness, you are tasting it, the, the sweetness or the bitterness, but then it goes down into the stomach and it's stored there and you don't taste it anymore. So the memory, like the stomach, doesn't have a sense of taste. He says, uh, when they are committed to memory, they are, as it were, passed into the stomach and they can be stored there, but they cannot be tasted. So, okay, that, that kind of works. And then he's got a, a little conjecture later on, maybe remembering is like rumination. And this notion of, of remembering or recalling recollection being like ruminating is, is actually going to be quite a important metaphor for understanding texts uh, from Augustine onward. Now, when we say ruminating, we're talking about something that we human beings don't typically do with our food. Ruminating creatures are those that have multiple stomachs. So the food gets chewed, it goes down into the first stomach, and then it gets spit back up into the, the mouth, and then it's chewed some more, then it goes into the next stomach. Think about cows, for example, right, or deer. Those are ruminating creatures. So the act of recollection is like rumination. It can bring the thing back up, but it's not coming back up in exactly the same state. And we can either feel nothing about it or we can feel perhaps even an opposite emotion. Now he goes into a discussion that I think requires a little bit of clarification in this, where he's using some examples. And the examples that he's using, these four passions or perturbationes of the mind. Um, this is coming from the Stoics, a philosophical school that was very uh, popular in antiquity that, that Augustine knew quite well. The Stoics had a theory of the emotions that broke it down into four basic classes of emotions and all of the different emotions fit into those four buckets in one way or another. Now, Augustine himself is not a Stoic. He actually thinks that the Stoics are a little bit wrong in condemning a lot of emotions when we have to be a little bit more nuanced. But what he's talking about here is sort of a commonplace of how emotions are Understood. So he talks about desire, cupiditas, right? The desire for something, the yearning for something. Uh, opposed to that would be fear, right? Metum. Uh, and fear can take a whole bunch of modalities as well. Desire is towards, fear is away. And the Stoics would actually say that desire and fear are for what is not yet present. Desire steers you towards the good that you perceive that you want and fear makes you go away from the evil that you perceive. Then there's joy, like titsia, 
and sadness, tritsitsia, um, and those are for present good or evil, at least perceived good or evil. Is this exactly the way the Stoics uh, articulate it? No, sometimes they talk instead of just desire and fear and joy and sadness, instead about pleasure and pain, you know, like voluptas rather than laetitia, right? Dolum rather than uh, tristitia. But it's, it's more or less the same sort of thing that Augustine has in mind. And he notes that all of these can be discussed or analyzed, even argued about without feeling these emotions. So he's using this stoic classification as an example of something that we can go into discussion about. And think about it right here. We've been talking about emotion, emotions that you yourself feel and have felt in the past that are going to keep on feeling. And did talking about this, did talking about joy make you remember joy? Think back to something that you uh, felt joyful about. It doesn't necessarily make you feel joyful now. Does going into psychological discussion about these things make you feel those? No. So there's something quite interesting, again, even paradoxical, about the way in which memory can deal with or bring to bear emotions that we have felt in the past, or even the very ideas that we've learned about emotions, say, from the Stoics. So there's a lot of interesting stuff packed just into this one chapter, this one consideration about what memory does.